celor amin. Începem următorul panel. The second B. And uh, we approach very interesting topics. We have one, two, three, four colleagues presenting. Please excuse it from Christina Boishan, the bureaucratic situation in his faculty is a new dean in Spiro Hyatt University. But she presented for the whole this paper. So I shall start uh, rapidly because we intend to give the floor of most of you to comment not only this section, but also the other section of the panel, B, very interesting uh, uh, topics. And let's go with uh, our, uh, for me, very old friend and uh, colleague Larry Watts, very well known by his uh, topics presented in books appreciated by both public and specialist. The title is After the Berlin Crisis, Romania effort to avert this West conflict and nuclear war. Larry, please take a floor. Thank you. Uh, first of all, technical. Uh, pushed east-to-west relations further towards open military conflict than they had been since Stalin. The Romanian communist regime, already engaged in the process of re-exerting national control over its political, military, and economic institutions, opposed construction of the Berlin Wall and what it saw as an unnecessary and dangerous Soviet policy of provocation, but with little influence on Kremlin behavior. On the contrary, during the crisis, Moscow actually ordered the Romanian army on alert Um, on, yes, I speak fast. Uh, on alert through its network of Soviet trained officers, bypassing entirely the national leadership and prompting Bucharest to end the participation of its officers in Soviet training programs. A year later, the world faced what is widely considered as its closest brush with nuclear holocaust when the Soviets and Americans squared off over the Cuban Missile Crisis. Again, Moscow attempted to order the Romanian army on alert without informing Bucharest, to which the Romanians responded with a purge of their Soviet trained officers and public protest against Moscow's evasion of Article 3 of the Warsaw Treaty, requiring mandatory consultation. In both instances, Kremlin orders threatened to implicate Romanian hostilities with the US and NATO in complete disregard to remain in opinion, preferences, or interests. In the latter case especially, Moscow's unilateral actions seem intended to, and were interpreted as, making Romania a target for U.S. nuclear retaliation. This was not because, this was not only because Nikita Khrushchev placed missiles in Cuba without informing his allies, or because the, show, the showdown in the Caribbean seemed to move both sides to the brink of nuclear exchange, or even because the placement of its military forces on alert suggested Romanian complicity in Soviet offensive preparations. It was because Moscow chose a Soviet tanker named the Bucharest as the first ship to challenge the U.S. blockade. Was this coincidental? Well, in the absence of Soviet documents, one can only speculate. That said, permit me. The Bucharest was the only ship in the Soviet fleet at the time with an unambiguously Romanian name. There was no ship named the Romanian. 
Moreover, the shift that immediately followed the Bucharest to the blockade line was the Fokkefreundschaft, an East German passenger ship filled with unwitting students and Czechoslovak technicians. Clearly, Moscow wished to imply that the Warsaw Pact allies supported and participated in the deployment while setting up the U.S. if it should take forceful measures against two ships having no connection whatsoever with the missile deliveries. <laughs> In order to avert future Soviet provocations leading to catalytic war, Bucharest developed a threefold strategy of reducing Moscow's ability to launch offensive operations through the Warsaw Pact, mediating the international tensions that Bucharest believed were exploited and even provoked by the Kremlin to expand Soviet dominion and influence, and hindering Soviet ability to unilaterally employ its nuclear weapons. Shortly before the first anniversary of the Cuban crisis, Romanian leader Gheorghe Gheorghedej signaled to President John F. Kennedy that the Romanians did not approve of the Soviet missile deployments, that they would not participate in the Soviet offensive war against the U.S., that the Romanian armed forces were fully under national rather than Soviet control, and that Romania did not and would not host Soviet missiles that could be used against the U.S. and NATO. In April 1964, Gheorghe issued what became known as his country's Declaration of Independence, actually a statement on the Sino-Soviet conflict, underscoring that no leading center superseded national authority and establishing the mediation of international tensions, including those between the Socialist East and the Capitalist West, to be Romania's sacred obligation. That December, Bucharest circulated its first call for Warsaw Pact reform, specifying the need for, quote, new ways of decision-making. At the 1965 Warsaw Pact summit, Jürgen countered Soviet calls for military buildup in response to the setting up of NATO's multilateral nuclear force with the recommendation that the Warsaw Pact members should instead propose, quote, disarmament, a collective security system, and a ban on nuclear weapons in Europe. Of course, disarmament was already a part of Soviet peace discourse. But when it was not entirely propagandistic, it was meant to apply one-sidedly to the aggressive arms of the U.S., and not to the liberating weapons of the Soviet Union. Gheorghe was the first to turn Soviet peace propaganda inwards, applying it to the East as well as the West. At the beginning of 1966, Romania circulated a comprehensive proposal for reforming the Warsaw Pact. Once that was ignored in February, uh, it was circulated to the international media in May, along with elements that later became standard in its proposals all the way up to 1989, for example, the rotation of top command functions to non-Soviet officers. Bucharest also requested a two-key arrangement, such as practice within NATO, whereby no nuclear weapons would be fired from an ally's territory without their approval. Referring to the nuclear provocation in Cuba as a source for the proposal, the Romanians rather clearly sought to diminish Soviet military control over the pact through the reform through the reform proposal and to encumber Kremlin ability to take unilateral military action, especially of the nuclear variety. As with its many efforts to transform, tie up, or tear down the Warsaw Pact military structure, Romanian involvement in mediation had specific, the specific goal of constraining Soviet power. Ceausescu made this very clear to Zhou Enlai in July 1965. And Prime Minister Maurer explained it to President Lyndon B. Johnson in June 1967, at the, same, at the same meeting where Johnson requested Romania's mediation of U.S.-Chinese relations. Johnson, not me. The pointed edge of Romanian mediation efforts often arose in discussion with U.S. interlocutors. Bucharest purposefully exploited manifest Soviet aggressiveness as leverage in pushing the U.S. towards China, and it repeatedly pointed out 
that Soviet influence in the Middle East was neither stabilizing nor exercised for the benefit of regional actors. Bucharest knew of what I was speaking. Regarding the 1967 Six Day War, for example, post Cold War archival discoveries appear to indicate that the Soviet leadership intentionally provoked Egypt's attack with false intelligence. Romanian mediations were quiet, even semi covert affairs, and public acknowledgement by the beneficiaries was rare. The efforts in the Middle East constituting the main exception. <laughs> After its failed attempt to establish a voice for Eastern Europe over Soviet nuclear policy through a two key arrangement, Bucharest changed tack. Since, Buc since Moscow was highly unlikely to cede any authority over the use of its weapons in a combat situation, the Romanians focused on transforming the security environment within which Soviet policy operated. Bucharest began campaigning against any form of military competition and arms racing advocated by Moscow and the other PAC members, lobbying instead for a strategy of competitive disarmament, one in which the ideas and recommendations of lesser allies were much more likely to receive fair hearing. If Romanian mediations were generally held at the edge or below the, the radar of Western attention, its campaign for military disengagement and disarmament within the Warsaw Pact was almost entirely obscured from Western view. Virtually any bloc statement or debate concerning alliance military policy or arms controls, especially when nuclear weapons were involved, was universally considered Soviet propaganda for Soviet purposes in both Washington and NATO headquarters in Brussels. According to East German Ambassador Siegfried Balk, who was briefed on the letter, as was Marshal Kulikov, it dealt with remaining conditions for renewing the Warsaw Pact, with the Soviet missile deployments in Europe, and with advice on the INF talks regarding the same missiles. The parallels between Ceausescu's letter to Reagan and the message sent by Yurgudesh to Kennedy were striking. Both letters divorced Romania from Soviet nuclear policy. Both stressed that Romania did not and would not ever permit the deployment of Soviet nuclear arms on its territory. Both messages stressed that the Romanian armed forces only responded to national authority. And both underscored that the Romanian military was available only for defensive operations. According to a Polish report on the 1983 Warsaw Pact Summit that autumn, this at the height of the Soviet war scare, in which the Kremlin apparently feared a preemptive U.S. nuclear strike, Bucharest leveraged official alliance policy to an extraordinary degree. The Romanians blocked efforts to one-sidedly condemn the U.S. and Western Europe, particularly West Germany, for the missile deployments, as well as efforts by the other PAC members, all of the other PAC members, to justify Soviet countermeasures. According to the Polish Foreign Minister, the greatest difficulty in reaching an agreement on a summit communique was caused by Romanian insistence. On a, un, on a quote, unilateral freeze on military budgets, the proposal to NATO for initiating immediate and direct negotiations between alliance members, and the proposal for a special commission of the Warsaw Pact states to limit the arms race and to begin disarmament, and also to enter direct negotiations with the NATO states, end quote. As the Polish diplomat noted, after intensive talks between the Soviets and the Romanians, Moscow agreed to call for a budget freeze and reduction, even if on a general level, and to offer negotiations with NATO if Romania postponed its demand for a Warsaw Pact Commission on Disarmament. The East German delegation was even more horrified by the Romanian proposals. Characterizing Bucharest's, quote, class indifferent destructive and extortionist attitude, end quote, that is more, quote, sharply deviating than ever before from the rest of the Warsaw Pact on fundamental issues of international class struggle, 
especially with respect to halting the arms race and disarmament, castigated for denying the, quote, importance of the Warsaw Pact and its further existence for the security of socialism and the maintenance of peace, end quote, Romania was described as particularly intransigent by the East Germans, quote, in its insistence that the socialist states should take unilateral steps toward the reduction of military arsenals, arms limitation, and disarmament, How disruptive of Soviet missile deployments Romania had come to be is suggested by a report from the East German intelligence at the end of 1983. Not only had Bucharest embraced President Reagan's zero option, calling for the removal of all nuclear missiles from Europe, it was even encouraging popular protest within those Warsaw Pact members designated to receive Soviet SS-20s. The irony here being that Reagan administration never intended zero option to be taken seriously. And Gorbachev was later able to perform a major coup and he forced the U.S. to adopt it. In conclusion, the Romanian policy to avert east-west conflict and avoid nuclear war was created during the crisis of Berlin and Cuba at the start of the 1960s. Although those crises were surmounted, the policy born of them proved remarkably resilient. Its central feature, encumbering the unilateral exercise of military power by the Soviet Union, continued to function for the next quarter of a century into the Gorbachev era. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, we maintain that uh, Romania was able to produce its own nuclear bomb by the end of the Ceausescu regime. Uh, if one looks at the uh, Romania's uh, position in the uh, East-West conflict and uh, also uh, takes into consideration the model of France, uh, which developed its own uh, force de frappe after uh, withdrawing from uh, uh, the military structure, it is logical to assume that. But what does the US archive say about that? Do you find any evidence on, on that? Uh, a doua... Întrebare este către domnul profesor Naiski. În anumite intervenții publice, inclusiv în interviu, Gorbaciov a susținut că la negociările 2 plus 4, ce au dus la reunificarea Germaniei, a primit asigurări că NATO nu se va extinde dincolo de granițele germanii reunificate. Ați găsit dovezi documentare în arhivele sovietice privitoare la această afirmație? Și ultima întrebare este către colega Mioara Anton. În ce măsură Well, the, um, in the 1960s, uh, the U.S. Uh, transferred uh, nuclear technology to a lot of countries as part of its program, Atoms for Peace. That equipment could be used also for extracting plutonium, but it was something we learned about later. The idea was to divert any attention or divert the tendency to produce nuclear weapons to one of using it for research for energy purposes, energy production purposes. The Romanians didn't, the Romanians studied the, uh, the manufacture of nuclear weapon as a possible alternative, uh, apparently in the mid-60s, but they never extracted the plutonium until the early 1980s, in a very interesting sort of circumstance. In the 1970s, the U.S. realized that it wasn't a great idea having this technology out there. They had given, given this technology freely to communist countries uh, in the 1960s, and so now they started asking for it back. The Romanians were willing to give it back, but at the same time, there was an entire research program built around that, and Pitesh. Uh, and uh, they asked what they could get it for in return, uh, since there would be a need to, to keep alive this, this whole institution. 
while the United States was debating whether or not they would give anything for equipment that they give away freely a decade before, a couple decades before almost, uh, the Romanians decided that the last days that they had it, they'd actually see if they could extract plutonium for, uh, from further on their own, which they did. They extracted a, a small amount of plutonium below the reporting standards of the International Atomic Energy Trade uh, Treaty. So they didn't report it, didn't have to. A lot was made of that at the, uh, after 1989, saying that the Romanians had extracted plutonium for a nuclear weapon that they were in violation of the treaty, which they never were. <laughs> In April 1989, of course, when uh, Ceausescu met with uh, the, uh, the communist leader from Hungary, Akali Gross, uh, he said publicly that Romania uh, had the ability to produce nuclear weapons. And that was used by Hungary, especially in the United States, to say that the Romania, Romania was not only interested in, in manufacturing them, they were manufacturing nuclear weapons, and they were trying to purchase nuclear ballistic missiles. Uh, which was kind of silly because they already had scuds and frauds, both of which could reach all the territory of Hungary, um, and as did Hungary. Uh, and that, uh, in fact, they were trying to obtain ballistic nuclear missiles, uh, ballistic missiles from uh, uh, Argentina and also from Germany uh, through the uh, Messerschmitt uh, company. Um, this is part of a huge program at the time in 19, 1989 that trying to portray, actually effectively portray Romania as representing an aggressive military threat not only to Hungary, but later on to Poland in August, uh, from August of 1989, and to all of Europe, actually. Um, the United States has no, uh, there's no indication that it's been declassified so far that the Romanians have gone any farther. In fact, after 1989, everyone actually forgot that there was plutonium at this facility in Pitesht. And the building was abandoned with plutonium inside for years after, until uh, somebody decided to check on some of this old state uh, inventory that they had here, there, and everywhere. Probably somebody interested in buying the property, and they discovered it, and the scandals began. Thank you, Professor Nice uh, presentation uh, regarding Ceausescu's opportunism. It, it's interesting that uh, by the 70s. It's, the opportunism went along different, very different levels, including the economic, as you mentioned before, was very important. Uh, right after the fall of the Shah, um, Ceausescu put together a delegation of uh, Romanian Muslims. Actually, they were from different Arab countries and from the Tartar Turk population in, the, uh, in Romania, and uh, sent them to uh, Komeni. And uh, when they got there, they advised Komeni not to, uh, they congratulated him on getting rid of Americans. Uh, the rigor, and then they uh, advised them not to allow or not to invite the Soviets in because the interests of great powers were all encompassing. And then they said, uh, of course, with the, all of your needs for modernization, we as a small country who have no large encompassing interests would be more than help, more, more than willing to help you with this situation. Uh, and they did the same thing shortly thereafter in May of 79 with the uh, the ambassador to the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan in Moscow. Uh, of course, the KGB picked up on all this and reported back. Uh, these are from reports of the uh, Soviet Central Committee. Uh, and the uh, KGB chief in Iran at the time was uh, 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 Sher who later became head of the KGB uh, briefly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, 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 Il est dirigeant soviétique, nous restons de grandes espérances sur une coopération de grande ampleur avec l'Allemagne unifiée. Et qui sait si l'Union soviétique existait plus long, qui sait le développement des événements. Merci, Alexei Commentaire. Euh, 